Hi guys, welcome back to Bromet Lectures. In this video, we're going to cover the microvascular complications of diabetes mellitus patients. Now we're going to cover first the pathology. Remember that with microvascular complications, uh, we discussed the non-enzymatic glycosylation mechanism. And that introduced us to uh, how these patients developed arterial uh, genesis and, of course, hyaline arterial sclerosis. Now, for the microvascular complications, we're going to have two mechanisms. The first one's going to be uh, osmotic damage, and this one is in regards to the formation of sorbitol uh, because of the excess glucose and the function of the aldose reductase inside cells. Now, this sorbitol is osmotically active and is going to draw water into tissues and depending on the tissue is going to cause the problem. The first one is going to be uh, damage to shunt cells and that is going to lead to peripheral neuropathy and of course damage to pericytes in the retina endothelium is going to cause retinopathy because of the formation of microaneurysms and if there's um, accumulation of sorbitol inside the lens, then that is going to lead to formation of cataracts. Now for the second mechanism, we're going to also have the microangiopathy. And remember that we discussed the hyaline arterial sclerosis. It is going to be the same mechanism. If it involves uh, the vasculature of the nerves, it is going to unfold as neuropathy uh, and also is going to add up to this Schwann cell uh, effect that we had with the osmotic damage. And, uh, in regards to the Kidneys, if we have this same mechanism with the uh, glycosylation of the basement membrane, there's going to be an increase of the synthesis of the type 4 collagen in these membranes and, of course, at the mesangium of the glomeruli, and that is going to increase your interglomerular pressure, and that is going to be uh, presented as albuminuria in these patients. So to summarize the pathologic mechanisms of the chronic complications of diabetes mellitus, we have in one side the microvascular complications being promoted by the atherogenesis that non-enzymatic glycosylation promotes. And for the other side, we have the microvascular complications in regards to the non-enzymatic glycosylation of the microangiopathy in certain tissues and, of course, the osmotic damage to certain cells. So let's begin with nephropathy. With this one, remember that it presents in around... 30% uh, of the diabetic patients. It is the most common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States. And remember, we talked about the microangiopathy. This unfolds as papillary necrosis. And of course, the nodule deposition on the mesangium and basement membrane is going to present as glom uh, nodular glomerular sclerosis. Now, at the biopsy, we're going to see the widening of the glomerular basement membrane, mesangial thickening, of course, the alienization of the vasculature, and uh, what is pathognomonic is the nodules of Kimmelsteel Wilson. And now for the screening, what we do is we perform an albumin creatinine ratio. We do it annually and we categorize patients as having microalbuminuria if they develop uh, from 30 to 300 milligrams of albumin in urine over 24 hours or proteinuric if they have more than 300 milligrams over 24 hours. So what we do with these patients when they are already in the microalbuminuria stage is we add either an ACE inhibitor or an aldosterone receptor blocker in order to um, vasodilate the efferent arterial and so to reduce the interglomerular pressure in these patients to slow the progression to end-stage renal disease. Now, these patients eventually uh, would require the addition of dialysis, and that's going to be for stage 4, stage 5, and stage renal disease. Now let's move on to the retinopathy. Remember that this one affects around 15% of diabetics. It is the number one cause of blindness in middle-aged patients, and uh, this disease has two classifications. The first one's going to be the non-proliferative. This one includes at slit lamp evaluation, the microaneurysms, Remember that these are caused due to uh, the osmotic damage to the parasites, some flame hemorrhages, exudates, and edema of the retina. And the proliferative is going to be the one that has uh, already developed neovascularization and vitreous hemorrhages. 
Now, this one is treated through laser photocoagulation because there is an increased risk of retinal detachment and blindness for these patients. There are other treatments uh, aside from laser photocoagulation, such as vascular growth factor inhibitors and other medications that have proven to have some benefit in these patients. But laser photocoagulation is the standard of therapy. Now for the screening, what we do is we annually evaluate uh, the retina through the slit lamp. And we're going to begin with type 2 diabetes patients at diagnosis. And for type 1 diabetes patients, it's going to start at five years after the diagnosis of the condition. And now let's finish with neuropathy. With this one, we have three different types of presentation, peripheral, mononeuropathy, or autonomic. So for peripheral, this is going to be the most common one. Remember that these patients describe a symmetrical involvement with a glove and sock pattern of both hands, both feet, and they usually refer uh, numbness, paresthesias, and pain. And on clinical findings, what you're going to see is decreased deep tendon reflexes, decreased vibratory sense for these patients. And of course, you screen this condition with a monofilament test performed uh, annually. And also remember that this usually progresses from positive symptoms such as burning or pain to negative symptoms such as uh, loss of perception and ataxia. Now with mononeuropathy, remember that this is a single nerve affection and it usually presents with uh, involvement of the cranial nerves and the most common ones are going to be the third, uh, the fourth and the sixth. And so the patients are going to present with ophthalmoplegia and different eye misalignments depending on the muscles innervated by these, by these different cranial nerves. Also, patients can develop foot drop or wrist drop. And now, with the autonomic component, remember that uh, it presents with different systems. With the GI tract, we have uh, difficulty swallowing for patients, gastroparesis, constipation, or diarrhea. Uh, with the cardiovascular, uh, this is where we see the orthostatic hypotension, and these patients can develop syncope. And of course, with uh, genitourinary, we have bladder paralysis or incontinence, and of course, the development of erectile dysfunction. And now for the treatment, uh, we have different therapies in regards to the different presentations. For the peripheral neuropathy, what we usually do is we have analgesics. Remember that these patients are in pain most of the time, so we first add analgesics and we also have either gabapentin or pregabalin. Remember that these medications take a few weeks to uh, have some effect on the patient, so do not forget the analgesics and uh, the addition of one of these. And also a second line, we have another um, medications which are the antidepressants such as amitriptyline. And now for the gastroparesis, what we usually do is we have mintoclopramide, and this one is a dopamine antagonist. And what it does is this uh, medication promotes the gastric emptying, and so it's going to get rid of the nausea and vomiting of some patients. But we can also add erythromycin, which uh, activates and promotes the GI tract movement. And so use this one for the patients with constipation. And now for the erectile dysfunction, the medication that we use is the venodilator sildenafil, and that's going to be for the microvascular complications.